Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this morning's panel discussion, Conformal Coatings, Best Practice Techniques and Applications. Miniaturization and the rise in high volume, high reliability electronics is increasing the demand for conformal coating. This panel is going to discuss some of these challenges and some of the new and emerging chemistries, applicators and techniques. Uh, I'm, just, I'm joined by a very distinguished panel, which I hope will be friendly. Uh, starting from the right side, we have Marie Kane from Abbey Kimmy. Morning, uh, Trevor. Good morning. Uh, to her left is uh, Chris Palin from Humaseal. Morning. And to his left, we have uh, Camille Siebert from Nordson Asymtech. Hello. Okay, and to her left, we have Phil Kinner from Electrolub. Hello. And then finally, we have to my right here, we have Stefan Schroeder from uh, Peters Corporation. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll start off uh, right away with my first question to you, uh, Marie. Uh, does miniaturization cause any selective coating issues? Um, yes, of course. As the component and tracks are getting smaller and smaller and spaces are getting tighter and tighter, um, the selectivity of the coating application is, uh, is, is getting even more challenging. Right. So the requirement for this is, uh, of course, to apply coating material in a much more accurate way and prevent material to, you know, splashes and uh, go in areas that we wouldn't want conformal coating to land, in keep out areas, for example. Right, okay. So, I mean, Chris, I mean, does, does the viscosity of the material, uh, is that important uh, yeah, it, it, with it the miniaturization? Plays, the viscosity plays a part, well, the whole thing, including the, the application system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, the, I think the question is, is there a trade-off in uh, throughput, speed, and accuracy? Um, you know, do the traditional film coating, jet dispense, etc. So there are many options, mm -hmm. um, but obviously speed of throughput and accuracy are two of the main things. Right. Okay. I mean, Camille, what, what uh, does that, what problems does it pose from the uh, coating applicator point of view? Because you're working with the machines. Uh, what does miniaturization do? Uh, what challenges does that, does that bring you? Absolutely. So when we talk about miniaturization, um, the entire board is not necessarily miniaturized, but it's those key keep out zone distances largely that are miniaturized. So in a lot of cases, we still have the, the balance need for cycle time and throughput on large boards, but still need that fine detail. So in a lot of ways, uh, pairing different applicators with different strengths, one that can do uh, most of the, the larger area coverages and something for fine tuning is a, a powerful combination. But then also once you establish that process, making sure that you put process controls in place to maintain that consistent process right. is really going to get you that stability in those critical areas. Okay. Um, Phil, a question for you. Do you see coating requirements in IoT devices? You know, Trevor, we get asked this question a lot. and. I think the answer is really yes, but what I don't really understand is kind of the difference between IoT and any other kind of networked application. Device, yeah. So from from our point of view, the demands are kind of the same um, in terms of the types of electronics that are being made and types of environments the electronics are being used in. So I don't really. Well, what would it be for you know the coating of the, the sensors, or for example, in. in in these IoT devices, I'm, I'm sure they don't, they don't need to be coated. You've got to be careful about not upsetting these. Um, but it's the same with any kind of networked mm. device that's communicating with anything else. So I mean, it, mm -hmm. the challenges aren't really, for me anyway, they're not really any different between an IoT application or any other kind of, of networked um, okay. sensor I, agreement. I think largely what we see is just the growth of having conformal coating in more electronics. And then with that, depending on the complication or the complexity of those electronics, how selective we need to be, how controlled we need to be, and maybe that's where we start to see some of that sophistication needed for conformal coating really come to play. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, okay, so uh, question to you, Stefan. I mean, uh, eighty percent, up until recently at least, uh, eighty percent of the people that are coating haven't been cleaning. Uh, but is that on the rise? Is, uh, the number of people that are cleaning before coating is it rising? 
I would uh, say that depends strongly on the industry. So mm -hmm. uh, there are still lots of um, coated electronics boards not cleaned before conformal coated. But um, this is where you have to save money. It's a uh, general industrial areas, um, automotive still. But if you go to medicine, uh, military, there are at least nine out of ten applications cleaned before. So um, I think everybody agrees that it gives you better results at the end of the day. But not everybody or the end customer is not always willing to pay for it. And therefore, to have an additional step inside it's challenging for a lot of our customers to put that in front of the conformal coding. But right. I think most won't, or, or most will agree, mm -hmm. it gives a better result. Basically, basically, high reliability applications are, are, are doing it, and, and yeah, it down to, as you move down towards consumer, it's less likely. Uh, I think also uh, component types um, are becoming kind of a, a limiting factor for cleaning. Um, certain packages, QFNs um, in particular are creating uh, and very small passives are creating more and more cleaning challenges where maybe sometimes you do more, more harm by actually cleaning than by not cleaning. So I think it's one of those things that it really depends on you know, what, right. what, what the nature of your electronics is. Yeah. And the I think what you're saying, the, so the, the, the components with low standoffs once you get below two, two mil, something like that, sometimes you can trap the, the, the solvent in there and it does more harm than good. Yeah. And, and partial cleaning, perhaps, yeah. yeah. Marie, I, would, I would add to what Phil uh, just mentioned that, uh, yeah, it's, it's correct that sometimes cleaning might be more harmful than, than not cleaning, but what's important if you don't want to clean and you want to coat is to test. Yeah. It's to really understand and control the level of residues and the quantity of residues you have on the board, mm -hmm. that it's very, compatible with the conformal coating you're applying on top. So it's all about testing the compatibility between the chemistries of you are applying um, and uh, you right. should be okay. So it's all about process control, validation and qualification. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for sure, as conformal coating manufacturer, we would prefer in an ideal world that all the PCB assembly would clean before coating because that will uh, take out a lot of the conformal coating defects yeah. that we see nowadays with like the wetting, bubbles, cracking after environmental testing. Yeah. So if you don't clean, just test. Yeah, it certainly doesn't uh, make sense. Trevor, really can, I, can I just add, traditionally we talk about high reliability as being military, mm -hmm. but as we, in automotive, as we move towards autonomous vehicles, yep. that's very high reliability. Yeah, I, I, and 90% uh, yeah. of that Maybe. industry is no clean. Yes, yes. Well. It's a good point. Uh, I would actually call automotive high reliability, but uh, as you say, that they are not cleaning enough uh, in, in that area. That's, that's a very important point. Another thing that's happening in the cleaning side is there seems to be a trend towards plasma cleaning. Does anybody have a view on that? We, well, this is really, it's really down to the substrate. Mm. So if, if the sub, substrate is good enough, is high, uh, high enough surface energy for coating, there's generally no issue. Um, in many cases, that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, inline plasma cleaning uh, does, does do a good job uh, and mm -hmm. does fix issues. Uh, I guess it's kind of fixing issues that exist that could be fixed in other ways. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, plasma, we do see plasma cleaning quite often. Yeah. I, would, I would mention that plasma is not a cleaning method. It's more a surface treatment method. You're not actually right. yeah. removing the residues from the PCB. You're activating the surface to get a good surface energy on the substrate, to get a high surface energy on the, on the substrate, to get good adhesion, good wetting onto yeah. your PCB substrate. So the advantage is, you know, plasma, plasma treatment is, uh, is very well known in bonding application, wire bonding application. Mm -hmm. For conformal coating application, we see your customers doing it just before conformal coating when the PCBs has very, very low surface energy. Yeah. But uh, plasma is a treatment, surface treatment uh, uh, method, not really an actual you're, cleaning method. You're right. It, it, it makes uh, the, the surface um, much more um, easier more to, activate, to... More activated. More activated yeah. so that mm -hmm. it's more prone to enhance the adhesion of the material that you're going to apply Correct. on top. Yeah. yeah, and I think going back to what Marie was saying earlier to do with um, process stability, what it really does is gives you a very consistent surface for wetting. So um, you tend to 
to kind of get a much more uniform coating anyway and then obviously better adhesion generally um, but it, it's more to do with keeping the process stable and consistent at the same time after time which is what everybody's looking for mm -hmm. okay uh, okay so um, Camille uh, do you see any new approaches coming for selective coating um, absolutely I mean we see innovation in conformal coating all the time especially as the market for high reliability coating continues to expand, that really pushes the level of sophistication uh, that needs to come with conformal coating. So that's everything from consistency on the fluid, consistency on the equipment, consistency on the boards that are being provided. Um, and so from that perspective, there's a lot in the way of process controls and developments that we can add to make sure that we're making the entire process more efficient. So whether that's um, innovations not just on the coating side but on the curing and inspection side mm -hmm. um, or new valve developments or new process control developments all of that plays into making sure that you end up with a a better and more consistent conformal coating process right okay anyone got anything to add on on new uh coating methods that are being used no yeah uh okay. the, the, there's all uh, traditionally dip coating was a was a thing yep. uh, and there are selective dip coat systems which are which are pretty effective actually and they, they mm -hmm. shouldn't really be ignored they're uh, yeah. they're there that's true i've seen these in some of the big uh, uh, contractors that are doing nothing but um, uh, uh, coating uh, it depends a little bit on the size of the of the batches you're producing the bigger the batches you produce it makes sense um, but the more flexibility you need in europe for example you have 20 different layouts uh, on, a, on a day uh, and not one for 20 lines, then it makes a big, huge difference. And as we start talking about the different pieces of equipment that support the entire coding process, if you're talking about new developments, then getting more information and communication transported to the original process, whether you have an ACI system that feeds back to the conformal coding system, yeah. um, that also really helps enhance the conformal coating process. So it saves um, the, the manufacturers from uh, a larger amount of failed boards. It really helps improve the process and they can address issues sooner so they can help improve their yield. Well, that's true. Everybody's asking for data these days, so we all need traceability of the process. Um, let's move on to the subject of masking. Uh, it's, it's everybody's pet hates because it takes so long. Uh, but it's is absolutely necessary. I think that depends uh, depends on your board, the design, the process, and the material. So, for example, if you're using paraline, mm. yeah, then you need to be really, really good with your masking because paraline is going to coat everything. Um, mm -hmm. If you're, okay. you know, if your board's well designed, then you should be, and you know, the areas that are not to be masked are kept kind of plenty away from areas that need to be coated. Then you really shouldn't need to be masking. Right. So, for me, so, it really so, so you're saying if you're not using if you're not using paraline, you, you can you can uh, rely on the the tight valve controls that you get on on some of these um, dispensers uh, to do tight line definition, and that's going to be that's going to be enough. You don't need to mask off the areas you're not you're not coating. I think that's a it's a it's a matter of design. So I yeah. think you know if you design with coating in mind mm. and you and the limitations perhaps of your equipment and your fluid combination, then you know, that's really what you want. So it's a design thing. I, oh, I, oh, sorry. I think to Phil's point, an optimal design is really going to give you the best, um, the best first step to having an effective coding process. But on the equipment side, we really get to see how the correct tool, the correct applicator can really enhance that process. We've had customers who've come with multiple um, projects that require masking, which obviously is an additional step, additional labor. Um, and with the right piece of equipment, uh, with a higher process control capability, um, better edge definition, then they can get much more predictable results and can remove more and more and sometimes completely eliminate masking from their process. Mm. Uh, just on the time issue for masking, yeah. uh, there are developments in masking technology as well. Uh, UV cure, temporary masking mm -hmm. uh, is reduces the time from the traditional um, 
uh, latex type systems uh, considerably. Really? Okay. Ultimately, if you can eliminate it altogether, that provides the most benefit to manufacturers. Yeah, you would think so, but you know, when, when I go into some of these uh, companies that are doing services for uh, conformal coating, I mean, they're literally masking everything. They seem to spend an awful lot of time doing it. <laughs> but I think that's their that's their their bread and butter. I think they <laughs> they end up with a lot of boards that you know, there's a reason why they end up with them, you know, and, and why they're very specialised right, so they, in they, doing that. They see that as part of, part of the service, do they? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's move on to uh, Stefan. Uh, what's the best coating chemistry for high volume manufacturers? <laughs> the whole board looked forward to that question already. Yeah. <laughs> um, it depends. <laughs> um, it's um, the, um, the focus of a lot of customers um, requesting it. It's um, going to avoid solvents. Um, that is one of the possible focus you can have. Um, going that direction, you want to have um, it fast, you want to save energy, um, you want to avoid VOC. Mm -hmm. So f from these points, having it for mass production very fast, um, I would come to the conclusion UV technology would be the right direction um, mm -hmm. for mass production very fast. If we have a customer requiring 1,000 pieces an hour, there's no way to talk about 10 minutes of IR curing or something like that. We are talking about three to 30 seconds um, UV cure. So right. I think for mass production, um, saving energy costs, and um, yeah, VOC. Would be okay, so UV saving technology. energy costs, VOC, and, and obviously a fast curing time is, is, is the important bit. Uh, I have a general question for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, is do you see LED UV cure coming into the market? Absolutely. <laughs> so um, what we define as UV LED technology compared to the traditional mercury doped arc technology and microwave assisted clearing system is that the LED technology has the huge advantage of energy saving, mm -hmm. cost saving, the board's temperature are much cooler when it yep. comes out of the board, so in terms of board handling. The other big advantage is that it doesn't generate any ozone, and also it doesn't really uh, create any RF interference, especially with the microwave-assisted uh, system. Right. Right. So um, the, your energy bill on the LED curing systems has been established as being three times lower than compared to a traditional mercury uh, arc or microwave-assisted lamp. Okay. Do, so, do, you, do you have to be careful about the the thickness of the coating that you put on these LEDs, uh, because obviously that can affect the, the luminance of the of the LED. Uh, we're we're a little cross purpose here. So, so what what Marie was saying is the the cure system. Oh, the cure system. The, yeah, sorry, yeah, the LED sorry. cure system. I, I I apologize. I was describing the process yes, advantages of UV LED system compared yes. to the traditional. Yes. Okay. UV system. Just just to answer Chris's question. Like, I see a lot of people interested in uh, LED. Um, lamps, but uh, the technology is, is there, the, the benefits are clear. I don't see many people uh, adopting it uh, at this time. I think, I think you're right. I think it's a little chicken and egg at the moment. Yeah. So not, not many people adopted it, but there are lots of interest on the equipment side, but also the mm -hmm. reason is because on the material side, the chemistries are still evolving and developed. Yes. But there are some chemistries out there that are fully developed, fully commercialized, and has been developed and really shown to be successful. So, um, yes, it's still in development progress at various companies, but there are chemistries out there that are readily uh, We know of usable. there are still limitations due to um, the layout of the boards. So if you have huge condensators on the board, UV LED curable coatings would not the first choice, of course. Well, then this is we are distance. talking about SMD yeah. components, yeah. and then it works pretty fine. It's, you, it depends on the layout again. But yeah. You can cure with a UV LED lamp up to 200 millimeters, really, really high. Hmm. So um, traditionally, yes, LED Very technology, you would have <clears> to cure it really close to the boards. But today, there are system in place and material in place which can be cured at really high height. So you can get uh, away from this height restriction now. And okay. Yeah, of course, anything's possible. 
but you know, the, the, the question I would have is, you know, what trade-offs are you making to, you know, to overcome the, the drop-off in power that's you know, proportional to the square of, of the distance? So, um, you know. not, there's not that much uh, changes in the irradiance on the height, and those new LED technology have been shown that, yes, when you increase the height, we can compensate on uh, getting enough irradiance so that you can still cure it within a few seconds and the, and the exposure. Yeah, I think interestingly as well, we, we talk about uh, single component materials, uh, dual component materials, but there are two component UV cure materials, mm -hmm. which is uh, kind of an interesting step for, for yeah. some people. Yeah, it's so funny we'll you should mention that, Chris. We've got a live demonstration <laughs> on our booth. <laughs> So anyway, let me ask you, Chris, I mean, with the, with the number of different applications that are opening up for conformal coding, what are the single biggest challenges uh, that you have or conformal coding companies have? I think so with, with some of the traditional materials, the, the solvent-based materials, mm -hmm. um, sharp edge coverage is always a, an issue. Yeah. Uh, there are ways to fix that. Um, you know, if you go back to when uh, conformal coatings originated, everything was coaxial leads, round leads, through hole, uh, and there were no sharp edges. Yeah. Uh, as we get smaller, uh, obviously the, the laws of physics say that uh, a, you put a liquid onto a sharp edge, it, it's not going to get there. a problem, that's yeah. where you get the ingress uh, under, underneath it, yeah. Um, anybody else, uh, uh, Phil, do you have any, uh, any suggestions on what the biggest challenges are for conformal coaters at the moment? Um. I think uh, it's, it's really uh, understanding there's so many different demands on, on the coatings. So mm. um, you know, different environments, different types of components, different board qualities, different board cleanliness, different finishes, I mean, there's, and different fluxes, different mm -hmm. pace. I mean, there's so many challenges right. to, to kind of, you know, They're all I always kind of, you know, when you, when you look at painting a car, for example, mm. you know, they to very great lengths to prepare the surface before um, before they they apply the paints. In, mm -hmm. in electronics, it's kind of like taking that brand new car, driving it through a field, and then painting it and expecting it to be perfect. And so <laughs> that that's kind of how I see our challenges. Okay. Right, okay. Oh. One last question to Camille here, and uh, I'm going to ask you: How do uh, conformal coaters maintain uh, the the uh, level, a consistent level uh, of, of coating in the best way? Right, so once they've gone through that gauntlet of selecting you know, the appropriate fluid and the appropriate equipment uh, for their process, um, I mean, customers can see issues from kind of three main areas, either from the board, whether it's clean and consistent. Um, they can see issues in variation from the equipment, so some degree of maintenance. Obviously, the more you can automate that and implement closed loop process controls, then the system can take care of itself. And then variations in the overall environment that can affect the consistency of the fluid. So whether you have temperature fluctuations throughout the day, whether you have humidity considerations that affect some of these moisture sensitive materials, um, all of that can contribute to variations that you see in the process. Yeah. So the more that you can streamline and maintain a consistent process, whether that's putting a cleaning process at the beginning to make sure that you're getting consistent boards, um, depending on your various fluid manufacturers to understand the properties of their fluid and making sure that then you have the correct piece of equipment uh, with the tools to make sure that you can uh, dispense correctly to what your application requires and maintain that process consistency that you yeah. need. Right. Okay, well, good response there and a uh, good response from all our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I want to say a very big thank you to Marine, Marie Kane from Abbey Kimmy, uh, Chris Palin from Humaseal, uh, of course, Camille Siebert from Norton Asymtech, Phil Kinner from Electrolube, and Stefan Schroeder from, uh, from Peters. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today.